and more powerful. So this is how kings in the pre-colonial period, you know, they achieve a sort of equality and go beyond that even. But the term inequality in the colonial period starts to get much more clear because once the British, the French, the Dutch came into Southeast Asia and they see grand, um, a lot of these places, such as Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, those are French, the Dutch had most of Indonesia, and the British, you know, Myanmar and Malaya, Singapore as well, you start to feel from the sources the issue of inequality becoming much more stark because the colonial empires believe that they have the right to rule, they have the right to civilize Southeast Asia. So that's the thing that um, sparks off this issue of inequality. And there's this idea among all the colonial empires that we have to choose a people that can help us in our colonial project. The French, for example, chose the Vietnamese to be our common apex, and this and they, they helped out the Vietnamese uh, in the French period will serve as soldiers, as administrators. Then we have the Dutch. They have chosen the Japanese to be a very central people in terms of maintaining Dutch colonial rule over there, to help out in the colonial administration. Then you have the British. Ah, that becomes a very complex issue. What did the British do in Malaya and Singapore? And now we have a very interesting complex issue which uh, goes on till today. Favoured people, who are they? Um, complex issue. Uh, they chose certain, uh, certain peoples from the royalty, Malay royalty. They chose certain peoples from the Chinese migrants, you see. So they, they created this system. Now, we go to the post rule period. Um, shall I'll talk about the Japanese a little bit. The Japanese invaded and crushed the myth of what's priority. But the system that the colonial uh, empires left behind is still present today. It forms what we know about race in Southeast Asia. All of you are aware of the CIMO category, thanks to the Malay others. That was started by the British. And there are a whole lot of legacies left behind by the French, by the Dutch, which are used by states today as a model of morality of how to categorize, how to rule over people. So that's the colonial legacy. But this legacy is paramount to producing more inequalities. I'm a historian, I look at processes, all right? So this, the, basically what I'm trying to say that we have, we don't have to understand inequality in Southeast Asia, we really have to understand colonial policy and practices. Those are the things that are still practiced by today's states, if I have not, you, you guys can um, basically see in your, in your fields how inequality today have a lot of links to what has been done in the past, especially in producing inequalities. All right, remember, colonial policy and practice has a big agenda to maintain colonial power as long as it can. It subjects people to a certain level in society, hierarchy bound, and on top of this apex in colonial policy practice are the, are the colonial masters, and the rest are the favored ones. But what is often under discussed is who are at the bottom of this colonial hierarchy, all right? It is from this bottom we can really see continuity still today, right? How people uh, reproduce, not really, reproduce poverty, how people try to get out of this trap, it's difficult to do so. I think ASEAN has tried very hard to, uh, to produce a kind of a society throughout some generations which is much more equitable, even less important. But the thing is, the colonial legacy is still there, all right? So that's Something you all have to think about, right? because I think I'm very glad that you allow me to speak first, because that's the first thing you must understand, colonial legacies of producing inequalities. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. So we have a historical context and background about why inequalities have perpetuated since the supposed founding of many Southeast Asian nations. Uh, maybe we can move on to Kelvin, and Kelvin works with educational and social inequality, specifically in Malaysia. So if you have any questions about that in the future, you can definitely ask them too. Hi guys, so um, Kelvin worked a lot um, in Malaysia, worked a lot with the youth as well in uh, Malaysia. So uh, I resonate a lot with what Dr. Kelvin said on colonial legacy that is not ever present in the region. So, um, having to work with community, communities in um, Sabah, Sabah and Sarawak and also in West Malaysia, um, 
a lot of a lot of the times people will seek asking, why is there this division of society? Why is that? Why is there stratification in our society based on race? And why is there racist policies at the present in Malaysia? Even though we are moving on to a more equal society, in Malaysia, we yearn so much to be like Singapore, to have a more meritocratic uh, society, to have a more equitable society. But then we know that that is a very difficult aspiration to achieve without having a new narrative that the youth are supposed to be to come up with. So before we move on to fight for an equal society, all we need to understand the differences between equality and social equity. Uh, it's not a VC lesson, it's not about private equity, it's like that equity. So social equity, in a sense, equality is giving equal treatment. Which is what a lot of communities we really desire, especially from the non cultural um, communities, because we identify ourselves as citizens of Malaysia and deserve the, the equal treatment as a citizen. However, due to selective interpretation of the federal constitution and um, Okay, I might not want to get myself into jail today, but some of the sensitive stuff here. So, um, so, due to selective interpretation of the federal constitution, especially Article 153, the provision that states the special position of the political community. However, people focus on the first clause, but they forget the second clause. The second clause is that the rights of the other races should not be delegated in a way and then be protected by the other people. So, a lot of the marginalized community that I hope they ask me, why am I trapped in this, in this cycle? There is always a glass ceiling that I can't break through. So when we want to give an equal treatment to all, everybody deserves equal treatment. And we have to identify that we are all different. We are not the same. So when, when we give equal treatment to other people, we need to understand the historical factor that has systemic, systemically distributed a particular community. And what are the specific needs that really needs to level up the playing field? Equality alone is not really level up the playing field. However, a, a more equitable approach, as in the enterprise with a particular community, you really understand the historical background of that particular marginalized community. Why are they in that rural area? Why are they in the city? Why are they in that particular geographical area? Then we you can go and work with them and really understand them. Because a lot of the policies in Malaysia, for example, like uh, the 11 Malaysia plan that strives to, to empower the bottom 40% in Malaysia. The average household income uh, for the bottom, bottom, bottom 40% in Malaysia is about 2,500 ringgit. And a lot of the youths, almost 63% of the youths are from the bottom 40%. And it's because of their income background, a lot of them are denied with the opportunity to have access to other professional development opportunities, such as conferences like this. A lot of them, they do not have the capacity for them to go further. Which is why a lot of the, and one in the booklet, one of the biggest problems in Malaysia is actually the human capital problem. So before we identify, before we want to solve all these problems, we really need to understand is equality alone, equal treatment alone, going to solve the inequality in Malaysia? No. But we need an equitable approach, a more holistic consideration towards the need of the community before we say that we want to give an equal treatment. Everybody deserves it. But people also deserve equitable treatment as well. A fair approach because all of us in, uh, are not on a level playing field. Imagine a marathon, in a, not a marathon, in a speed, speed run. The runners in the inner circle will start a little bit further from the, the runners at the outer circle. It's because the runner in the inner circle has the advantage of running the shorter route, but the runner in the outer circle runs a lot longer route, and then it's what they all different something on. And then it's an applicable practice, because all of them have the equal opportunity to run the race. But all of them are at a different starting point because of the route that they are running. So when, we're, when, when people are considering about having to have a more equal society, think about the equitable approach. Think about what are the things that we really, that the community really need 
and the resources that you need for them to be on the playing field before they even pass the benchmark that you have already set for them. So, as you, uh, I'm probably staying in Chester's guys, or younger than you guys. So, um, what are the things that you guys can do? Uh, I'm actually excited to be here. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm old. So, um, what are, the, what are the things that you can do? Number one, we need to use the policy making process. And of course, to apply equitable practices in that to really empathize and understand the community and also to capacity to yourself to really go in to the ground, really understand what it is. The problem with Malaysia is that a lot of the policies are once paid off. Everything comes from Putrajaya, feed out to the entire country, which is rather irrelevant. For example, when the government is trying to solve school dropout, since they basically build um, hostels and things like that to overcome some of the infrastructure um, challenges in, in rural areas. But as you talk about, there are many other factors as well. So when you're trying to approach the problem, it is not always one single factor of it. For example, poverty or even job, even money alone is not enough. But we really need to look into the entire well-being development of, of the particular community. For example, like healthcare to nutritious food and things like that. Because some of them are So, what the youth can do that? What else can they do? Second thing is to be community leaders, actively work with the community, and to push the gap between policy makers and also the leaders for working with the community. So, uh, I have to stop right now. So, I, I want to see more questions coming up from here. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Right young faces in the morning. Not mine, but. <laughs> so, can I have a show of hands? Who are from Indonesia? One, two, three, four. Can I ask how old you are? Huh? Eighteen. Okay, so, but you've lived in Indonesia? Yeah. Oh, no. So, you were one year old when democracy happened in Indonesia? Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the others? Are you around the same age as well? 17. 17. Yeah. Okay, you may have not been born. <laughs> okay, that makes my job slightly easier. So, you guys were born into a democracy. The Indonesian people in this, in this, uh, this hall. Um, which is not your fault, <laughs> of course. Um, but this is the thing. Um, Yesterday's talk by Professor um, Wang, Professor Wang was, was, very, was very useful because it gave us a sense of history and Dr. Anthony as well was telling us about history. History teaches us also what happened in the past. It also teaches us not to take for granted what we have now. Right now, you are all in the, you know, actually Southeast Asia is in this environment of democracy in different stages, in, in, in different levels and various levels in Southeast Asia, which, is, which makes ASEAN very unique. What's different, with, um, and people ask, and some of you have spoken to me um, yesterday as well, the difference between the EU and the ASEAN, and ASEAN. In ASEAN, we have varying levels of democracy, some very democratic, and some eh, not so democratic. Where you place your country in that in that um, in that street is is really up to you. Um, I have my own uh, rating, <laughs> um, but again, uh, this is this goes to show how much it, it is very important for you to get to know each of the countries um, uh, that you are you know the person next to you maybe from a different country. Find out what's going on in in, in each of your countries and each other's countries. The reason being is to learn what you have, and it's also to learn what other countries don't have, but not just gloat about it, but to learn what it is that we can make. And again, um, Stephanie gave us a task of, of how it is that you have a role in creating equality in, in ASEAN. And, and this, is, this is a type of forum where you can do that. So for me, I mean, the work that I do, I, I'm from the Habibi Center, and I work for a brilliant man who was the former president of Indonesia, 
um, who was the president that, that the transitional president during uh, 1998, 1999. And in those 18 months that he was president, he, he made a lot of changes, uh, one of them including freedom of the press, and, uh, and, um, and, and he, he put in elections. He had no desire to be president. I think that's what made him also successful. He didn't want to be president. He was just faced there, and he did the best job that he could. I can say that I'm slightly biased because I work for the guy and he signs my paychecks, but, um, but it's true. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, in, in the 18 months, he passed, I think, 2.5 laws in a day or something like that. It's, it's, it's ridiculous, um, uh, the, the achievements that he's had. It's, it's, it's uh, now people appreciate it. Um, but because of these changes, we now feel that, especially me, because I also, yeah, very good. Um, mm, uh, <laughs> let's not talk about age. <laughs> um, but no, I because I know what it felt like to be in an in, 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 in Indonesia where you couldn't um, you couldn't speak out, or you could speak out, but you'd have to bear the consequences of perhaps standing in jail or or getting kidnapped or by the authorities. And it's not, it's not arrest, it's getting kidnapped. Um, we came this person two years ago and elected a, pres uh, a, a president that was involved in the kidnappings. Um, <coughs> anyway, um, we didn't elect him, by the way. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, because it was, because I'm a product of that as well. I grew up in an Indonesia where my father was. Um, was one of those that was arrested because he spoke out. Um, I spent, uh, when I was five, uh, my dad went to prison for 14 months because of the fact that he spoke against the government. Um, so I know how it feels to not have something, not have that right to speak, not have the freedom to, to say what you want to say. Again, in Indonesia at that time, during the Sohaka years, there was um, a lot of development, a lot of growth, and, and yes, we can, we can credit that to that, uh, to that government, but we also were deprived of a lot of things. A lot of it was inequality as well. Um, you, have, you have a lot of people with, who are very rich, there's a like, top 1%, of course, or like uh, any other country, um, except for one that has a lot of or that has a lot of 1%, okay. Um, and then you have, um, and then you, and again, inequalities range from from uh, from income disparity, from race uh, to to just um, Indonesia is very big, and you had development happening in 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 in, um, in extreme, uh, uh, you know, but you had uh, in, in Java, for example, but you had like outer islands where there was none, no development. And until today, we still have those areas where you, where it's not reached by electricity, school education. So some of the statistics that we, we get sometimes is very um, misleading because those areas may not be counted. So things like that that you um, that I think makes makes a person when you see inequality, inequality and and you ask, what can I do about it? And I think this is you are all at this juncture where you can ask that question and actually start to do something about it. As you choose your majors, as you choose your what you want to do after after you graduate, how you choose to do your um, summer program internships or whatever, they all um, kind of lead to a path where you can actually answer about inequality. And again, um, Calvin, and we joke about it, um, that Calvin gets death threats. Um, he made that joke about it. We know. Um, but but it's, 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 it's something very true. So currently, um, something mentioned what I'm doing right now. So right now, when I, I work for, like I said, I work for the Habibi Center that focuses on democracy and human rights. And again, when we talk about human rights, it's, it's, it's a whole range of human rights. Um, for us at the Hungry Center, because we know that there are already uh, organizations that are working on the political and social rights, we talk about economic rights, we talk about right to education, right to access to technology, the right to access, yeah, the right to access to um, 
information, all of which are very important for, um, for, for everybody to develop. Um, so right now I'm working, because um, Stephanie already mentioned the change.org petition. Um, this is what I'm, what I'm doing right now with, with a group of friends. And it's very important, again, we were talking about it yesterday um, during, during the coffee, um, where we had um, a discussion of, of where there needs to be a lot of cross-sectoral uh, um, collaboration. Um, how many of you are doing social sciences? Okay, how many are doing medicine or engineering? You need to collaborate. It's it's often so this is this is the experience I'm having now and it's it's an, an eye opener for me. This is the first time I'm, I'm I'm doing this effort. So my friends and I are part of a team called um Mulai Bichara, which is let's talk about it. Um and it's 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 fighting sexual violence. Because one of the things um, that we found in Indonesia is that this um, sexual violence happens and there's a rape culture in Indonesia that's not spoken of because people don't want to talk about it. Which is why the campaign is called Mulai Bijara, talk about it. And so the, my team consists of a psychologist, a doctor, um, me, I don't know what I call me, um, <laughs> Uh, um, and uh, uh, a, a social, you know, a tech expert um, that does all our tech stuff, a graphic designer. So everyone has a role in that team. And we launched a petition three weeks ago to push for the bill to end sexual violence. Because the bill is out there, it's been put on the bottom list of the uh, parliamentary agenda, and we want it to be pushed up. So it was triggered. Uh, it was triggered by an incident where a 14-year-old girl in Bengkulu got raped by 14 men, and some of them, some of them were her age. She was a school girl walking home from school, um, and she was raped and murdered. Now um, she became this um, the martyr for our for our cause, and so uh, we started to change on our petition um, called Lilun Adalafita. We are all Lilun. Um, three weeks ago, it's now at 65,000 signatures. But what's more significant is when we got, overnight it got 35,000, and then, you know, the, the spike went overnight. But what was significant is the, the collaboration of different sectors enabled us to not only gather those signatures, but now the team has appeared in three major top um, TV shows in Indonesia. Um, we have submitted a petition to the, um, the head of uh, the commission that deals with sexual violence um, in, in Parliament, have had um, submitted also to um, the, the, the chief of staff of the cabinet, and is now pushed up on the priority of the legislation list. <laughs> and we did that in two weeks because of what is the collaboration. And this is because we felt there was it's inequality. There was no one speaking for the, for the victims. There was no one speaking for the survivors. It was all talking about um, how much sentencing should be done and everything. But these are the things because we saw something that was, that was not right and we made a conscious decision to do something about it for all different sectors voluntarily. And I think that's kind of the guy that you guys told us. Thank you so much, Mia. Right, so we've heard about colonialism, we've heard about structural discrimination and oppression in terms of race, we've heard about the intersections of democracy and equality that when you have a voice, you're able to push for equal rights for different marginalized groups. And now we're going to hear from Patrick, who works in the private sector in the Philippines. Thank you guys. Do you mind if I stand? Because there's a whole group here that doesn't see Yeah, that's why it's sure. Is that okay? Do you mind? Yeah, you don't have to push that over. It looks very heavy. She also looks very strong, though, so she's good. Please don't. Yeah, there's plans there. You guys want to test stands? Yeah? Because I don't want to, like, you know, if, I, if I'm too ugly, then I can sit back down. Just let me know. Okay. But before I start, I'm going to do, like, a little group. Because he's cool. I'm not cool. You guys mind if I do this? 
Can everybody give me a favor, stand up and make as much noise as possible and don't stop until I tell you to stop? Yeah, stand up please. Okay, on the count of three, please make as much beeping noise. I'm going to do my best not to, you know, say expletives here, okay? Because I do, I do curse a lot, but I won't. Okay, good. Do me a favor, please make as much noise as you can. Please rock in the entire Singapore, which doesn't seem to be too big anyway. Alright, so... So please, ready? Here we go. One, two, three, go! <laughs> okay, um, let me ask a few questions first before I begin, just to try to get to know you guys a little bit more. Um, how, many of you, how many of you guys here know what you want to do in life? You guys know in high school, right? I spoke to one, one, uh, one lady in Singapore, from Singapore, doesn't know what she wants to do yet, which is totally fine. You guys are very young, should you like out there hanging out and meeting people, all that kind of stuff. Anyway, I don't know, I was about to say some things, but... Um, <laughs> How many of you guys know what you want to do in life? Raise your hands. Actually, you know what? Big round of applause to all of you who know what you want to do in life. Thank you. How about those who do not want to do it? How about those who do not know what they want to do? Okay. Um, can somebody who does know what they want to do? Is my speaking English? It sounds weird uh, to me. Uh, can somebody tell me what they want to do? Uh, anybody? Who, whoever knows what they want to do? Somebody, raise your hand. Who else? Okay. A lady in back with glasses. Sorry? Human rights laundry. Human rights laundry? <laughs> lawyer, lawyer, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> human rights, I'm going to watch the human rights. Okay. Money laundry. <laughs> that's, that's my top player on entrepreneurship. Top player later. I'm just kidding. Um, anybody else that know what they want to do? Yes. I want to be a judge. You want to be a judge? Okay. Also, law. Okay. A judge on life. A judge on life. <laughs> You'll have your own pearly gates. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. American Idol. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? On this side. Yes. Entertainment industry. Entertainment industry. Awesome. What do you want to do in the entertainment industry? You want to be. Filmmaking. Filmmaking. Awesome. Okay. I would. Yeah, there you go. There's power in everything, right? Okay, next, everybody, one more, one last. Yes? A writer and comic artist, awesome. Okay. So I'm going to applaud for the, for the judge and for the uh, human rights wanderer. Please <laughs> give them a round of applause, okay. Does anybody here, by raise of hands, uh, has anybody ever considered being an entrepreneur? Yes. That's a decent amount. Okay, cool. In entrepreneurship, uh, just so within that crowd, uh, for those future entrepreneurs here, how many of you guys want to go in? Uh, tell me what kind of business you want to get into. Somebody, raise your hand. Yes. Sorry? Hotel management, okay. Do you want to own a hotel or do you want to be a hotel management company? Okay, <laughs> totally fine, very cool. Anybody else? Yes? Travel agency. Travel agency, you did mention that, right? Yeah. Oh, yes, awesome. Anyone else? Yes? Social enterprise, awesome. Thank you for bringing that up. You took the words away from the mouth. Okay, <laughs> next, last. IT firm, awesome. So do you want to get into technology or do you want to provide technology services? Uh, provide technology services. Provide technology services, awesome. Alright, so here's the thing, uh, and here's what I've kind of noticed, I think Calvin's kind of an expert on this as well, but a lot of people, myself included, when I, get in, when I started getting into entrepreneurship, you would think that an NGO is not a business. I thought that NGOs weren't businesses. The fact of the matter is, NGOs or social entrepreneurship, you're, you're a business person. You've got to figure out some way to make money for a business, correct? 
So I want you guys to consider this as an entrepreneur because you know you guys are the future. And honestly, if you look at any, if you just Google it, you guys can Google anything these days, right? You can Google it. Uh, small businesses, medium or SMEs make up most of the economy in most countries, actually. Unless you're talking about oligarchs and stuff like that. But still, a lot of the, the small, medium-sized businesses will make up most of the economy. And that could potentially shut that is you, that is am I speaking English here stage? That is you guys. That is that, that are you? That is you guys. That is, <laughs> for those who are not going to be quote unquote entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs will always have traits. Sorry, all of you guys will need to possess traits that entrepreneurs traditionally are known to have. Okay, so I'm going to go through a few of these traits, just three, if that's okay. I'm just going to go through three. Um, and I think this is really what's going to help. I'm going to back up with examples of what I see from a um, the social inequality perspective in the Philippines is what I know, okay? So, um, okay, actually before I start, do you guys know that it's never been so cool to be an entrepreneur? In history, it's it, like, along, like, from the history of time, it has never been so cool, quote unquote. Cool is a cool, do you guys still use the word cool? Yeah. Okay, good. See, that's how I feel you. I feel you. Okay. No, you're still young. Um, it's, it's never been so cool. I'm not doing it because it's cool. I'm doing it because I want to make a difference. Just it for, actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> okay. Three traits. And I'm going to leave it with this and I'm going to pass it on to, to you guys for QA and stuff like that. Um, number one, and this time I will use an expletive, but that's okay. One expletive, to the right. First and foremost uh, trait that entrepreneurs will have, okay, is don't take shit from anyone. Yes. You guys understand that? Yes. Yeah, if you understand, make a big round of applause. Let's try it. And again, you don't need to be an entrepreneur to understand that this is what this is the way you guys should just be. Uh, and, and if you guys have a voice, which is what we were talking about earlier, you should speak out. Um, don't be afraid, uh, you know, your father went to jail for 13, 14 months for speaking out. Um, look, if you guys want to make a change, uh, whether in your businesses, uh, in the film industry, as a comic book artist or a writer, um, as a human rights lawyer, say the right thing this time, uh, or as, as a judge, you need to be able to speak out. Okay? Entrepreneurs, they don't take shit from anyone because they need to get shit done. You understand? Okay? And so here's the thing that brings us back to kind of something that really um, sickens me. And I, in fact, about uh, five weeks ago, I was so uh, affected by this that I kind of made a proclamation to the rest of uh, to the team, uh, to the teams at uh, where I work, uh, Island Partners, um, is that in the Philippines, and from what I hear, this happens in, in a lot of countries, and it also happens with Walmart, there's something called contractualized employees. Do you guys know what this means? Okay, uh, employers, uh, especially in the Philippines, especially with the oligarchs, actually not even just the oligarchs, and it's become kind of the, the standard in the Philippines, and it's really sickening, where people are hired uh, on a, con a contractual basis for six months, um, by the labor law, six months and one day, uh, an employee is automatically regularized as a regular employee, which means it's much more difficult to kind of uh, remove them from the company. It's, uh, they also have to get paid health insurance and have all these other benefits that begin. But co uh, companies are taking advantage of this and they're saying, okay, we're going to hire you for six months, then we're going to get let go of you, and then we're going to rehire you for either a different subsidiary or a different company, so that we don't have to pay you benefits. The fact of the matter is, because it's become a standard in the Philippines, nobody is growing their careers. So how in the world do you think that there's ever going to be social equality in the Philippines if this continues to happen? I'm telling you this now because as future entrepreneurs, as future filmmakers, as future hoteliers, as future judges, or whatever it is that you're going to do, you have a chance to stop this, especially as entrepreneurs. In your IT firm, what are you going to do? Are you going to hire people for six months? Or are you, going to, are you going to promise to me right now, and to yourself, and to everybody else in this room, and to your future employees, that you're not going to do that? You won't do that? Can you raise your right hand and please say, Judge, where are you? You have your mind? Okay. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Am I running out of time? I'm sorry. Okay.
Okay, 30 seconds. Here we go. Number two. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do it in a minute. Um, no, see, now I forgot what I was going to say. Thanks, guys. Okay, number two um, is that uh, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you've got to be able to think long term. Okay? I'll, you know what? You can talk to me about number three. Let's leave that as kind of like a, a, a special surprise that for you guys to come and talk to me or whatever. Okay, number three. The number two is think long term. Okay? Thinking long term is what most great and successful entrepreneurs do to build greater businesses, not big businesses, greater businesses. Okay? Let me bring this back to social inequality. There's people that I've worked with that I promised um, giving them a farm to or something like that. Uh, or promised giving them, uh, you know, something else uh, that is much larger than what they are currently getting now. Uh, just for in exchange for, you know, the, the great work that they're, they're, they're probably providing me and I wouldn't be able to pay back, right? Um, these people would rather kind of just steal money for the short term uh, and they, they're not really thinking about how a lot of hard work now, because this stuff really does take hard work, if you think this stuff happens overnight, it doesn't. Whoever tells you that is lying to you and they're probably just trying to make money off of you. Um, I'm serious. Uh, if, you're, if you guys are thinking long term, what actions are you taking right now to kind of grow whatever you need to grow, whether they're skill sets, whether they're uh, whether that's your network or whatever it is, um, in order to have a brighter future. Again, taking it back to the Philippines, people don't think about it. People think about what am I going to put on the table today? Okay, and then there's there's a lot of issues. I'm going to kick off the stage. Where's the hook? Okay, bye guys. Thank you. Come talk to me, come talk to me later. Ask me questions. Thank you.